Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Diane, for having invited me here, this beautiful uh, city, uh, which is a bit like I expected. Nice, uh, clean air, uh, beautiful views, uh, very kind people, very young, uh, projected towards uh, tomorrow. And so I'm very glad it is my first time, and I'm not so young, to New Zealand. And so I'm very glad to be here, to be here with you. Um, the focus of this is uh, today and tomorrow. And we have discussed up to now a lot of this uh, under the perspective of individual lives. Save today for your tomorrow's welfare. It's very important, but it's not the only one. And today we will look at uh, today and tomorrow under a different perspective. And that is the perspective I want uh, to show here with the presentation. Okay, this is the title. This is the demographic transition. It's Italy, but it could be any country in Europe. And it could be most of country in, uh, in the world. So what does this mean? It means uh, that you have age group, and you have women and men. And this is what it was yesterday, 71. Europe was like this. Many young people, and uh, as uh, you go up in the pyramid, the number of people restricts. Now look at what is happening. This is today, today. And you see that the number of young is restricting, the number of older people is increasing, and uh, the pyramid aid is increasing also. So you have people, many people, women in particular, over 100. And look at this. Uh, this, is what, uh, this is tomorrow, 2061. So what is this? Today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Are we preparing for our future? It's not only to say that we have to say that is the individual perspective, but we also have a perspective of society. Are we, oh, sorry. Are we, I thought you were objective. <laughs> um, so are we preparing for our future and this is, uh, uh, we can discuss this uh, very important question, I think, under many perspectives also. But what I want to say today is something about uh, the pension system. Because the pension system is something that ties together all the generations in order to have uh, for us, uh, enough uh, savings tomorrow. So we are looking at this intergenerational pact, uh, that is the pension system, which we call an intergenerational pact, uh, and uh, we are asking whether we are preparing adequately for the future. So what I want to talk, uh, this is just to show that you can think at yesterday, tomorrow, today and tomorrow, taking a societal perspective, okay? Now, what we are going to see is, uh, oh, this is New Zealand. You see, it's very different. And you understand now why your minister yesterday said, our pension system is sustainable. I would have liked to question him, but we had no time. But of course, you see it's very different because the pyramid is not yet and will not invert itself soon. While in Europe, 
we have this inverted pyramid, okay? So you are in a much better shape. In any case, we are talking about uh, pensions, uh, a topic that is on everybody's slip as a nightmare for somebody or as a dream for the young in particular. Reforms are dreaded by the public and by politicians as well. Challenges, what do go governments, well, they try to introduce reform. You have opposition uh, from the uh, trade unions, uh, the opposition, political opposition, experts analyze and generally disagree. Everyone has a personal interest since aging and retiring are just a part of a normal life, a part of our life. So, what I want to say is that uh, we cannot just look at this individually. We have to take what Sue yesterday said, it's mutuality. Welfare comes from sticking together. And the pension system is an instrument for this. And so we have to see that it works effectively. There are many diverging views on pensions. Uh, one interest test would be to, to see whether we, have, whether we share a definition. Somebody think it is a, a right, a political right. Some, somebody think of labor income as the basis and worry at what kind of uh, uh, job would guarantee a nice pension. And I found this uh, quote uh, from uh, Jane Rowling saying, my parents, both of whom came from impoverished backgrounds and neither of whom had been to college, took the view that my overactive imagination was in a music work that would never pay a mortgage or secure a pension. Now she could pay the pension for the queen. <laughs> oh, there are, uh, let's say, uh, saying that, uh, try to say, how many times do you see a report saying uh, the pension crisis? There was just one released by, I don't know which bank, recently psychological terror. The stories of Detroit's bankruptcy was simple enough. Allow capitalism to grow the city, campaign against income inequality, tax the job creators until they flee, increase government spending in order to boost employment, promise generous pension plans to keep people voting for failure. Rinse, wash, and repeat. Shapiro. Or, there is a disregard, this is Waitley, chase your passion, not your pension. So don't think about the pension, it's too far away. Just chase your passion. Many diverging view. But what is a pension? I just want to stress one thing, which is not very commonly thought of. At the center of a pension, whatever it is designed, you have risk. And so a pension is something that insures against risk. You have uh, particularly longevity risk, which is an individual and uh, a society's risk, aggregate risk, and risk is at the center. It's not just like uh, any other financial insurance. That is a pension. But we have pension system. Pension system should help people providing for their retirement. It's the saving function. Prevents poverty in old age. That is a very important function. And also reduce inequality, which is something that we, we saw yesterday in your presentation, Diane, has increased. A public institution, so the pension system, we call it a public institution within the welfare state, ruled by the law, supplemented by a regulated market, what we uh, talked about yesterday. 
increasing savings within a regulated market. Uh, so typically you have a public pillar and a private pillar, and you have risk everywhere, pervasive risk. So, oh, this uh, is the life cycle of individual, the saving function of pension, it's uh, too complicated, it's just an academic device. So pensioning society, macro foundation, a pension system we are talking about, population, intergenerational contract, okay? To work, for this intergenerational contract to work, we have to look at three main elements. One is demography. We have seen how demography is changing, even here in New Zealand, even, even in Australia, and that is population aging that is a threat. Growth, we are here in a country which has not suffered much from the crisis, but Europe and most of other countries have suffered a lot. So lack of growth, growth shortage, is another threat for a pension system. Then politics. Politics is tempted. A pension system should be, said before, an intergenerational compact. So you should look ahead, be farsighted. But you have next election next year. Can you be very farsighted if you have your elections next year? No, you are tempted. You are tempted for the present voters, not for next generations, not for the young who are shrinking in the population. I just give you an example. In Italy, we have a very important vote in December about a referendum. It's a referendum about the constitutional change. Very important. And you know what the government did? Increased pensions. Why? Because the young are so few, and the older people are so many. And he wanted to be nice to the people, because he wants people to vote yes at the referendum, and not no. So it's, it's common, it's not just Italy. Ask the French people, ask André. He will tell you a lot of things about the French politics. Funded system, yesterday, funded system, private savings for retirement are not risk-free, absolutely. There are many um, risks also in uh, savings, financial risk, uh, financial crisis. Now, one, one of the problem for pension funds is that everywhere interest rates are going down. They are near zero or even negative. And you are talking of inviting people to save for their retirement. And they ask, what is the return I reasonably get from these savings? And if you are honest, you will say, well, about zero for many years ahead. Insurance companies, are they happy with this monetary policy of very, very low interest rate? No, they are not. But it's a fact of life. And as the chairman of the European Central Bank said, it's going to last. It's going to last. Inflation. Then you have excessive costs, mismanagement, frauds. I don't uh, just look at this. Uh, that shows that everywhere the frauds have increased. The compare uh, 2013 with 2015, and you see it goes from 17 to 20, from 63 to 80, uh, 83. The number of people who haven't uh, uh, suffered from fraud, uh, declined from 83 to 63. So all the others had experience of fraud. So what makes a good pension design? We have to consider that we said risk. So here we have to see that there is a, 
a good distribution of risk. That is the main thing. When uh, yesterday you talked about the Kiwi, very important, but you have to consider the whole picture because Kiwi is just one part of your retirement savings. And this should provide something which is different from the rest, from your public pension system, so that what one does, the other maybe does not, but does another thing. So they complete each other in terms of risk allocation and risk insurance. Typically, um, you need also to have a good incentive structure, since of how many pension system, just four minutes? What do I see here? Okay. A good incentive structure, not to encourage people just to uh, leave too early, to exit the labor force too early. If people are healthy, they would like, and they should be incentivated to work longer then you have fair distribution instead of privileges, poverty reduction and prevention. Look, a pension system should not, should avoid the privileges. And we have too many just granting privileges. And the way to do this is to segment the system. When you have a very, a highly fragmented system is because you want to grant some privilege to somebody. So it's lack of transparency that is the way for privileges. And then transparency, uniformity, and low political manipulation. Here is uh, another expression of what I call the demographic risk. I just uh, show you the first two countries, Japan and Italy, but also Germany, UK, US, it's the old age dependency ratio. The number of uh, older people with respect to the number of, working, of the working population. So it's going to double in most country in the next four decades. This is a real challenge, whether you like it or not. And uh, it is in this context that, uh, for example, immigration should be considered. We don't have time now to talk about this. The economic risk, of course, is the crisis and uh, the fact that, and unemployment. Consider you have a working age population, but then uh, if most of them, not most, if a large number of them do not work, because it's very difficult to find jobs, or they just work in precarious ways, how can they support a growing older population? That is the economic risk. For this, what do we need? We need growth, economic growth. We need economic productivity growth. Reforms, why reforms? I just want to uh, consider that uh, whatever is the definition of reform that you take, they refer to changes, not only in the rules, but changes in behavior. You do the reform not just because you want to change the law, no. You want to change people's behavior. You want people to be convinced, for example, that it's very important for them and for society to work longer in those circumstances. And changing behavior is quite difficult, as all behaviorists know. So you have to explain reforms. And what do you do to people? Why are pension reforms needed? And the usual thing is that you have to regain financial sustainability. You say your pension system is not sustainable, just the opposite of what your minister said yesterday. It is sustainable, he knows. Maybe he has the right to projections. In Europe, we think unsustainability is the problem. I was in Malaysia recently, and they are very worried about their pension system although their demographics is quite different. 
and uh, you want to reduce distortion, you want to strengthen adequacy. Again, this is a question of integrating the public system with private savings to have, uh, let's say, a decent uh, uh, income in retirement and an adequate provision also for, let's say, survivors, for widows, for example, and you want to increase the transparency. Now, I just want, would like to show you this picture, which is my interpretation of pension reform. I take one minute to this, okay? And uh, one minute is this. We have two main perspectives under which we uh, value our pension system. And one is sustainability. It's not easily defined, but we have indicators. It means, uh, okay, if you project the system 50, 70 years ahead, in the US projections cover seven decades, in Europe mostly five decades, okay, you have indicators of whether the system is sustainable. I give you just an example. If every year you have uh, outlays for pensions which are higher than contributions, then uh, do you think the system is sustainable? No. So it means that sustainability means that you are, should be in the position to have uh, over the long run at least, if not year by year, to have contributions that covers for pensions, not for the redistribution, not for assistance, um, that covers your pension expenditure. Okay, that is an idea of sustainability. And then you have adequacy. If you want to make your pension system sustainable, you could just cut pensions. That is very simple. You cut pensions, so you go down, you reduce your pension, and you increase your sustainability. It's, it's what economists call trade-off. The more generous you are, the less sustainable you are. This is a very uh, painful trade-off because it seems that you have sacrificed something in order to have something else. And it is typic the typical situation in economics is like this, okay? Uh, and this is the interpretation that uh, is uh, most common for pensions reform. How do you put pension reforms in which context? Austerity. All people say, oh, it's austerity. They cut pensions because they want financial sustainability, which people do not know what it is, right? Now, there is a different interpretation of pension reform. And the other interpretation is this. This is the current situation. This is today. But we can go like this with a reform. We can improve the trade-off. It's not a trick. It is improving the trade-off through what? Changing the design. Having a more efficient pension system. Not encouraging early retirement for healthy people, of course. Having a better pension formula. For example, DC instead of DB, very generous DB plans, like by the people, but very often they are for privileged people, not for ordinary ones. So if you can convince people that a reform is to increase this trade-off, to, um, to uh, have a better trade-off, then you can interpret a reform, a pension reform, like a social investment, okay? It's not an investment that you do personally, but it's a kind of social investment giving benefits to society, taking up the mutuality that there is in a public pension system. This is not very easy to explain to people, I tried when I 
When I was ministering in my country, I tried when I talked to, to people, it's not easy, but it can be done. And this is part of what I call financial education. This is just a quote that I like from Jean-Claude Juncker. He says, we politicians all know what to do, but we don't know how to get reelected once we have done it. So that is because uh, the interpretation it does is to stay on one trade-off, not to move the trade-off. Because if you can make people believe that the trade-off is moved further on, then also people can see what is good in a reform. Why only politicians should know what is good in a reform? And there must be a, something which is good in the reform. So I just skip this. Information is essential. This is an example of the very famous uh, orange envelope, telling people what they have in their pension account. It's public, mind you. It's not a private pension. It's, a, it's public, but it's in for people. Because to understand, people have to be informed. And very often, politicians do not want people to be correctly informed. They prefer a bit of manipulation. Uh, seven essential notion. One is pay as you go as an intergenerational contract. I go very quickly because uh, you all know these concepts. Uh, of course you do. Rate of return, compound the interest. Postponing retirement increases benefits. Uh, more because you have more contribution and lower expected longevity. You have risk diversification. You have high payroll taxes. You want high pe pensions? Increase payroll taxes. But then that means high labor cost. That is something that in Europe is almost prohibited because we already have high uh, labor cost. Acquire rights fallacy. Another outcry, it's my right. And you ask, yes, but have you paid for it? Who is paying for you, for your right? And you are not nice if you ask, ask this question, but it is the question to be, of course, for generous pension, not for poor pensions. And then lump of labor fallacy. The idea that if you want the, the young have jobs, then you have to uh, make uh, easier retirement for the older. Exit the older, enter the young. It's not like this. That is a lump of labor fallacy. So the new paradigm is to have continuation of reform transparent information, and financial literacy, which uh, should be an alternative to both paternalism and populism. And so this requires uh, that we take very, very seriously investment in education. And this is my preferred quote, which I adopted when I was a minister. And it is, it's easy, impossible, tough going, worth a shot. And I really believe that financial education is worth a shot. Thank you. Elsa, are you uh, okay to answer questions? Yes, yeah? uh, if there is time. Yeah, no, let, I think it's important actually. Let's um, open it up and we'll just grab five minutes. Uh, so we'll run around with mics if people want to signal um, any questions. Maybe you were so thorough you've um, answered everybody's questions. Oh, I've got one over there. <laughs> Sustainability of KiwiSaver here. Sorry, I did not. Uh, the minister speech yesterday. Yes. About what? You said you would like to have asked him a few questions. Could you just sort of elaborate on your views on what he said? Oh yes, yes. For example, uh, uh, he didn't say uh, almost anything uh, about uh, how the system is financed. 
okay? So he said, it's sustainable. And with a population outlook like this, I believe. Meaning that uh, you don't have uh, the demographic challenge that is so typical of Europe and many more countries, okay? So you have uh, this population. And also from an economic point of view, I mean, uh, unemployment is very low here. So it means that people are working. And uh, another thing that people should know is that the best uh, promise for a good pension is uh, decent and uh, long enough uh, employment, that is. So decent salary, okay? Uh, so the demographic and economic outlook here is much more favorable. But I just don't know, for example, if uh, the, the pension, uh, the superannuation is DC or DB if it is the, uh, defined contribution or defined benefit. If it is defined contribution, it's like an insurance scheme that is collect, that is mandatory, and that is collectively managed. And that is the, uh, let's say, generational compact. It is pay as you go, pay as you go. So it means that you take uh, contributions for working population and you, immediately use the proceeds to pay for pensions. That is the generational compact. Uh, given the population and the uh, economic conditions, this can be sustainable. But if it is DB, what is the incentive structure that you have? Uh, is it uniform? Is it universal? Those are the questions that I would have liked to ask him. So we are going to have a pension panel next that I'll be on. <laughs> and so I'm happy to go into some of the more detail on the perceived sustainability and how much the super system costs us in New Zealand and our growing thoughts on what that means. Any other questions for uh, yeah. Elsa? Hi Elsa, I'm Lavinia from Brazil. Uh, I would like to know your thoughts about how can we transpass the politics side that um, we that prevent us to make the change that all the the systems need in all countries. Okay, I know of no country where the pension system is uh, designed within the constitution. So it's not a constitutional law. That means that parliament can change, okay? And as I said before, if you have uh, a generational compact, you should give uh, weight uh, to the present generation's uh, interest, but also to the young and to future generations. The trick is that if you are a politician, you talk to the current people and you don't think so much of future generations, okay? So the temptation to be more generous is high in politics. And this means that you are piling up debt, debt. Because when you have a bond or a bill, what is written there is, I will pay this to Andre if Andre is giving me the bill, because that is part of his wealth. That is a promise that I make to him, okay? But if I promise a very generous pension, it's more or less the same. So if I am very generous, that means debt. And what are, you say, uh, uh, what we can do to reduce this uh, political manipulation? And my answer is, uh, is double. On the one side, you have uh, to have a very transparent design of the pension system. It's not to be fragmented. It is to be DC. It is to be, the, the simple message is, you pay contribution. This is a kind of savings. It is compulsory saving. Then you have, uh, you, you have what you have uh, contributed in, you receive your pension. This is for 
everybody with exceptions, motivated for the poor, not for the rich. When you have exception for the rich, that is exactly political manipulation, okay, lobbyism. That is no good. So transparency is key, but transparency should be combined with people awareness. Now, that is, the message is, uh, it's a long way. It's not immediate. But if you have more educated people, people that can understand what's going on, and that just don't think that they owe their own pension to politicians, uh, because this is not the way I am, I should not be grateful to a politician for my own pension. I should be grateful uh, to myself because it's the result of my work, then that means that you reduce the incentive to political manipulation. Right. Elsa, can I ask you to grab a seat because you're on our panel next? Can you please join me in thanking Elsa for this morning? Thank you.